Hi there. Welcome to your last lecture in ABS 470. You've done it. Congratulations. So lecture 7.4 is entitled Infraorder Cetacea, and it's going to align with chapter 20 in your textbook. You'll certainly recall from the last lecture that the whales and dolphins are now squarely placed within the order set artiodactyla. They're in a suborder with the hippos that's called whippomorpha. The dolphins and whales do, however, warrant their own infraorder, the cetacea, which is our focus today, and it's further subdivided into two parv orders. The first is the mysticetes, the massive filter feeding whales, including the largest animal to have ever lived on planet Earth larger than the largest dinosaurs by far, the blue whale on the top left, which can weigh upwards of 330,000 pounds. <laughs> you can see the bowhead whale here on the right, which is about half the size of the blue whale, and you can see it in comparison to an African elephant, the largest terrestrial mammal. You can also see this unique structure here, the baleen, and we talked about the baleen uh, a long time ago in our lecture on mammalian modes of feeding, but we're gonna revisit that a bit today. And then the second par of order is called the odontocetes, that's the toothed whales, and that's going to include the unicorns of the sea, the narwhals. What are they using those horns for? We'll come back to that. <laughs> um, we'll cover the Amazonian pink river dolphin, or the bato. Uh, this is a freshwater species. Certainly doesn't have very good eyesight, uh, but pink river dolphins can navigate the flooded forests of the Amazon using echolocation, just like the Chiroptera. We'll unfortunately have to discuss the most critically endangered cetacean, which lives just to the south of us, <clears throat> in the northern Sea of Cortez around Rocky Point. We'll talk about the panda porpoise or the vaquita, the little sea cow. There may be as few as 10 vaquitas left on planet Earth. And then you'll watch a clip on the mind-blowing physiology of the deep diving sperm whale, which may have bioluminescent teeth <laughs> that it uses as lures to attract its favorite prey, which are giant squid. How do we know that they're doing battle with giant squid? Stranded sperm whales that wash up have battle scars, suction cup scarring uh, from fighting giant squid. So hopefully, I've saved the best lecture for last. I promise you one of your questions on your comprehensive final exam will be to place whales in the correct order. And we know that whales and dolphins are in the set artiodactyla, the set that stands for cetacean. With respect to your final, I'm actually started creating it this morning. Um, I will make approximately 75% of your test questions over module six and module seven. That's gonna be the bulk of the questions, but about 25% of the questions will come from earlier modules. There'll be big idea type questions from modules one, two, three, four, and five. I am not going to ask you about obscure families from like six weeks ago. I promise they're gonna be 
big main idea types of questions that I hope you've uh, internalized uh, from working through this content. You will all surely know, however, that whales and dolphins are in the order set artiodactyla. They're sister taxa to the hippos, both within the suborder Whippomorpha. Remember, we've combined whales and hippos into a suborder. Cetacea, which is Greek for whale, is actually an infraorder. So Cetacea contains 14 extant families, and as usual, we're going to cover them all here in. Those families can be divided into two parv orders, the Odontoceti, the toothed whales, and then second, the baleen whales, the Mysticeti, like this gigantic fin whale here which is gulping up mind-blowing amounts of plankton, zooplankton. The larger mysticetes like this are known as rorquals, which is a Norwegian word meaning grooved whale or tube-throated. So it refers to those longitudinal grooves or pleats on the throat and the chest that are going to allow for just incredible expansion of the oral cavity as the throat fills with water during lunge feeding. So whales are characterized by extremes. As I mentioned on the first slide, they include the largest animal that has ever lived at 330,000 pounds. Adult blue whales are heavier than the biggest dinosaurs. So here's a blue whale in comparison to a Brachiosaurus, and it just dwarfs a Tyrannosaurus rex here. Here's Megalodon, uh, the largest uh, carnivorous shark uh, right here. Um, so blue whales can reach 30 meters in length, which is almost 100 feet long. Uh, here it is, it's full length in all of its glory compared to a school bus. <laughs> so other extremes, the sperm whale right here. The sperm whale is a grand champion for lots of records. They have the loudest voices, capable of producing low frequency vocalizations greater than 180 decibels. And as will be discussed in the video that you'll watch here shortly, that's loud enough, at least hypothetically, uh, to potentially kill a human <laughs> just from the sound waves. <laughs> Sperm whales also have the largest brain of any living animal and they have complex language, as sophisticated as our own, including what are called codas, repeated patterns of clicks that they are using in different contexts in social uh, uh, situations when they group with conspecifics. Sperm whales are also one of the deepest diving mammals, capable of enduring tremendous water pressure at depths that actually collapse their lungs. According to the American Museum of Natural History, however, it's the Cuvier's beaked whale that holds the diving record for marine mammals at 2,992 meters which is 9,816 feet. Whales characterized by extremes. One more extreme. The gray whales can migrate 20,000 kilometers. So you can see them off the California coast um, as they make their way uh, from Alaska all the way down North America, all the way down to Baja. So 20,000 kilometers, which is 12,000 miles. Whales are characterized by extremes. So how did whales get so big? Well, First off, we have to recognize that they live in the ocean. So most of their tissue is actually neutrally buoyant. 
they float in seawater. So they're not having to support that incredible mass against the gravitational pull exerting all of that pressure on legs and muscles like uh, like big mammals on dry land have to like elephants and hippos further as explained in this uh, American Museum of Natural History video when we break down how the oral cavity of the filter feeding whales scales up in three dimensions they're going to engulf far more than expected based on the physics of their body size, of the dimensions of their body. So please check out this video, How Did Blue Whales Get So Big? Blue whales are massive. That said, body size varies considerably among the cetaceans. So more than half of all whale species are the relatively small dolphins and porpoises, ranging from the relatively small California Harbor porpoise, or the vaquita, all the way up to, let's see, here's the killer whale, which is the largest member of the dolphin family and the Baird's beaked whale, and then the sperm whale, which is the largest tooth whale, and then on up through our filter feeding whales, all relative to the size of an African elephant. Lots of variability from the harbor porpoise to the blue whale. Whales are even more astounding when we remember that they evolved from terrestrial ancestors, right? So this evolution begins in the early Eocene and all of the associated anatomical, behavioral, and physiological changes that are necessary from a complete and total transition from living your entire life on terra firma to being fully aquatic. Whales live their entire lives in the water. They're born in the ocean and they die in the ocean. All of these adaptations are all secondarily derived. So the fossil record for this transition as whales become more and more aquatic is just, it's, it's amazing, it's astounding. Um, and it's quite complete. There are lots of transitional fossils, no matter what the creationists are selling you. Um, so we go from this dog-sized hoofed animal named Indohyus, and the video I'm about to show you is going to talk about the anatomy that links Indohyus to whales. Indohyus is the closest non-cetacean relative of whales. So we're going to move to from Indohyus, this dog-sized animal, to uh, Ambulocetus, which is essentially has like a crocodile niche. Of course, it's not a reptile, um, but it lives in river deltas and hunts kind of like a crocodile does sitting uh, on the water. And so we're going from Indohyus to Pachycetus, to Ambulocetus, right? And then we're getting more and more aquatic um, look at what's happening to the legs and the pelvis until we get to modern whales. Like this, modern baleen whale. And look what's left of the pelvis. These tiny little pelvic bones is all that's been retained. Tiny little vestigial structures. 
So this is awesome. I watched this PBS Eons clip entitled When Whales Walked uh, when I was putting this slideshow together and I realized that I completely butchered <laughs> the name of the ankle bone that I talked about in lecture 7.3. So the ankle bone, the double pulley ankle bone that's present in Indohyus and the set artiodactyls is pronounced the astragalus, not the astragulus. <laughs> Laugh out loud. So clearly I have done a lot of learning too in building this course for you. Um, so. Put me on pause now and check out this video and I assure you that I'm going to put one question from this video on your final. So take the six minutes and watch it please. Regardless of whether we're talking about a gigantic filter feeding mysticetes or a smaller member, a toothed whale in the odontocetes, all cetaceans have a fusiform body shape. That is to say, bodies that are streamlined for efficient propulsion through the water column that minimizes drag. All cetaceans are going to propel themselves using their tail flukes and they're going to move those flukes uh, through caudal undulation. So dolphins and whales are propelling themselves up and down. Okay, Sharks are moving side to side. Okay, so that's a big difference between these two lineages of pelagic hunters. So another thing that I'd point out here um, is the stomach structure of dolphins and whales is similar to that of ruminating set artiodactyls in that cetaceans have a three-chambered stomach. Okay, so it's further evidence placing the cetaceans within this order, the set artiodactyla. But, of course, whales are not ruminants. They are not eating vegetation, chewing their cud. All whales are carnivorous. They're not ruminating. <laughs> Another interesting thing about cetacean morphology, all cetaceans have these highly modified telescoped skulls in which the posterior bones of the cranium are all compressed and they overlap each other. But the anterior portion of the skull, the rostrum, has become greatly elongated through the extension of the premaxilla here in dark gray and then the maxillary bones. So telescoping was in place by the Oligocene some 23 million years ago and this elongation of the rostrum has been accompanied by the posterior displacement of the nostrils, the external nares. So the nostrils um, from this white-tailed deer here, this set artiodactyl, um, they've migrated on the cetaceans and they're now on the top of the head. It's what we call the blowhole, right? So that way this portion of the head is all that needs to be above the water for the whale to breathe. Additionally, the odontocetes, like this dolphin, they have asymmetrical skull structure. Look at the nair here. See how it looks different on the right side in comparison to the left side? Okay, this asymmetry is purposeful. It's going to uh, relate to the production of sound pulses for echolocation. So in lieu of going into a big long explanation about cetacean echolocation as well as diving physiology as described in your textbook, I'm going to ask that you watch this 
21 minute video. I know it's kind of long, but it's absolutely fascinating stuff. So it's focused on sperm whales. It's going to talk about all kinds of things. So their heads are filled with spermaceti oil. It's not actually sperm, but it's used as a buoyancy compensator that's going to allow them to dive. Um, and when they get way down deep, their ribs are flexible, allowing for the total collapse of their lungs. Their teeth, uh, as I mentioned on the first slide, might be bioluminescent lures to, to lure in giant squid. Uh, they have these massive brains, and so researchers in this film are going to talk about their use of codas, uh, these distinct click patterns they use in social situations that sounds like Morse code. And so, so from start to finish, this is uh, well worth your time. Um, I would say that the real world is even better than Avatar. All right, so we'll begin our taxonomic survey, our final survey, with the parv order Mysticetes, which is comprised of just 14 species and six genera within four extant families, including the bowhead and the right whales, the pygmy right whales, a bit unusual, uh, gray whale, also a, a bit of an unusual lineage, the mink whales, the fin whale, the humpback whale, uh, the recently delineated Amura's whale, the massive blue whale, the say whale, and the bird's whale, which I actually saw on a dive trip in Thailand. This whale was bigger than our boat. When we saw it, we stopped and we leaped off, um, saw it dive down deep. It was pretty epic. In terms of the number of species, the baleen whales, the mysticetes, comprise only about 15% of living cetacean. So mysticeti actually means the mustached whale, and it's a reference to their most characteristic feature, uh, these baleens, which you can see here. Okay, um, so the baleen has given these massive whales the ability to filter feed, and it's opened up this new ecological niche that has allowed them to colonize the world's oceans. The baleen is composed of keratin, that's the same protein material that makes up the horns of rhinoceroses, which we talked about in the last lecture, and the fingernails of humans. Plates of baleen hang in a comb-like fashion from the upper jaw only. And depending upon the species, there can be from between 155 to almost 500 compact plates of baleen on each side of the upper jaw. So this is the way it works. So the whale is going to engulf enormous amounts of water that are filled with plankton and nectin. Nectin is just smaller fish. It's a size class up from the zooplankton. So all of this microscopic food, small fish, are going to flow into uh, the baleen whale's oral cavity. Blue whales can gulp 16,000 gallons of water at a time in one mouthful. mouthful. So <laughs> 16,000 gallons, that's a good sized swimming pool in Phoenix. So this water is not swallowed, um, but it's actually going to be engulfed and then expelled through the baleen out the sides of the mouth as the throat and the thoracic cavity contract. And then the baleen, that comb, is going to catch all of that microscopic food. The mass of zooplankton that's trapped on the baleen is then scraped off with the whale's tongue and swallowed. It's an amazing system to filter feed. During the summer, baleen whales generally feed in the far northern or southern latitudes on the other side of the world, where they're going to accumulate these vast stores of subcutaneous fat, or blubber. 
So this is the feeding grounds here of the humpback whale, the North Pacific humpback whale. So during the winter then, they're going to migrate long distances right to either places like the Philippines, uh, down to Baja, or to the Hawaiian Islands, to warmer, more equatorial regions. It's important to note that feeding is greatly reduced during the winter because tropical waters contain a lot less food. There's a lot less zooplankton in the tropical Hawaiian waters, why the visibility is so good. So during this time, the whales are subsisting off all of that stored blubber that they stockpiled in northern waters during the summer. So many humpbacks will head to the Hawaiian Islands to calve with their numbers peaking in February. Um, it's awesome. <laughs> There's a whale festival uh, in Maui every February. So my wife and I used to live out there in 2009 and 2010 and the humpbacks were just spectacular. So breaching, jumping out of the water and splashing down just a stone's throw away from the edge of the beach. When you go snorkeling, you put your head under the water and you can hear them singing. It's just, it's epic. So speaking of singing, baleen whales do not echolocate. Okay, the odontocetes echolocate, but the mysticetes do not. But they do produce a wide variety of sounds. So these include moans and grunts in the low frequency range, and then higher frequency chirps and whistles, and then very high frequency, as much as 30 kilohertz, which is 30,000 cycles in that wavelength per second, these pulsating clicks. So because these vocalizations are so loud and water is such a good conductor of sound waves, humpbacks and other mysticetes can transmit their calls for hundreds, possibly thousands of kilometers. These different sounds serve a variety of different communication functions, some of the most important of which are to identify sex, social status, and location. And we're really just beginning to decipher um, whale language. We have a long ways to go. There's no Rosetta Stone as of yet. So we'll begin with the family Baleen Opteridae, within which there are currently eight recognized species and two genera. Baleen Opterids feed on zooplankton by gulping, also called lunge or bulk feeding. The mandibles of the blue fin and say whales are the largest single bones of any vertebrate that has ever lived. As discussed earlier in the course, humpback whales are known to use bubble netting. So that's a technique where they're going to work cooperatively and surround these bait balls with bubbles, trapping them in uh, dense concentrations, allowing conspecifics to come up and gulp them in efficient feeding. So humpback whales, blue whales, and other species within this family were drastically over-harvested throughout the early and mid-1900s. Their blubber was processed into a type of oil which was used for lamps. So prior to the widespread electric grid, so we used whale blubber uh, to light our homes. As a result, today, blue, fin, and say whales are endangered and they're protected from whaling, um, although the Japanese still uh, practice some whaling. And ship strikes also remain a significant mortality factor, as well as beaching events uh, associated with um, radar, sonar. Regardless, because of their very slow life tempos, right? So whales take a long time to reproductively mature, um, and then their uh, gestation is very long, and the rearing period, the time that the calf spends with mother nursing, is also very long. 
recovery of large whales has been very slow since the whaling days and the reality is most of these species will probably never regain their former numbers. The gray whale constitutes a monotypic family. It's the only species in its family. Gray whales feed during the summer in shallow waters of the North Pacific. So they're going to roll on their sides and they're going to suck in muddy sediment from the bottom of the seafloor to strain out a whole variety of worms and invertebrates and amphipods and decapods. So during six months of feeding, a gray whale consumes over 200,000 kilograms of food, right? So that's over 400,000 pounds of food <laughs> because their feeding areas way up in the North Pacific are going to freeze during the winter. In autumn, gray whales migrate up to 20,000 kilometers, one of the longest migrations of any mammalian species. They're going to follow the Pacific coastline of North America to calving grounds down in Baja, California, or the Sea of Japan. The family Neobalenidae is also a monotypic family that includes only this species right here, the pygmy right whale. So it's one of the least known cetaceans. It occurs only in temperate and cold waters in the southern hemisphere. So we have records from 196 sightings and strandings of pygmy right whales over a 125 year period. And those were all associated, the sightings and strandings, with areas of high zooplankton productivity. It makes sense where the zooplankton are, the pygmy right whale is tracking those blooms. As suggested by its name, it is the smallest of the mysticetes. Females are only about, only, about 6.5 meters in length. Males are about 6 meters, so it's reverse size dimorphism. The females are larger. And um, they're about one-third the size of the North Atlantic right whale. The family Balenidae is comprised of two genera and four species, including the bowhead whale, which is occasionally called the Greenland right whale. It inhabits northern polar waters throughout the entire year. The North Atlantic right whale, also called the black whale, is found in subpolar, temperate, and even subtropical waters of the northern hemisphere. The North Pacific right whale is now considered a distinct species. And then we have the southern right whale, which is shown here, which occurs in temperate and all the way down to Antarctic waters. Right whales, but for whatever reason not bowheads, can get these abundant callosities that occur on their heads. So kind of give me a little bit of the heebie-jeebies, but um, they're really fascinating. So these are rough white or yellow patches that are covered with barnacles and whale lice lice, they're not actually arachnids, they're, they're amphipod crustaceans, so they're related to shrimp. The lice mainly feed on algae and flaking dead skin, so they're not really uh, parasitic and they're not leading to significant illness. These patterns, however, can be quite useful to researchers because they're unique to the individual. So researchers can build databases of these individuals for mark recite studies. All right, moving right along to the second parv order, the larger parv order, the odontocetes are the toothed whales. So like bats, the odontocetes are going to rely on echolocation to navigate their surroundings. And as such, echolocation has really shaped their morphology. So echolocation was an integral part of the evolution of the odontocetes, and it developed very early on in archaic toothed whales the forehead of toothed whales that you can really see in this beluga. 
uh, is this complex system of nasal sacs and then this fatty melon, both of which are going to function in echolocation. As the sound is generated, it's reflected by the parabolic or the disc shaped skull and focused and modulated through air sinuses and this oil filled melon in the forehead. The low frequency echolocation sound pulses that whales emit they're not as variable as those of bats, but the effective range of their echolocation signals is much greater. The returning echoes are received via the relatively small and thin mandible in the lower jaw. The mandible also has oil-filled sinuses that channel the sound directly to the auditory bulla. The oil in the mandible and the oil in this fatty melon is the same stuff. All right, I love this family. The mono don today includes just two species, the white whale or the beluga, which I just showed you on the last slide, and the unicorn of the sea, the narwhal. Both of these species occur in polar waters along the coast during the summers and then in the pack ice in the winter. In male narwhals, the left upper tooth develops into a long tusk up to three meters in length. That's 10 feet long. And it's got a counterclockwise spiral. In female narwhals, there is no tusk. So this canine tooth does not erupt in female narwhals. So why do they have the tusks? So there's two recent publications that I looked at, and they argued different primary uses. The first publication argued that the tusk is used as a tool for sensing changes in the environment, like differences in water temperature, salinity levels, even the presence of nearby prey. And then the second, I think, more predominant argument is that that tusk is a sexually selected trait. It is in males only, after all. Um, so the thought is, is that the tusks are used to establish dominance hierarchies. And the males are going to spar with each other, not by jabbing each other, but by crossing their tusks at the base and jostling for a position. So they're using these tusks to compete with each other, male-male competition, and essentially attract females. Female narwhals may select mates based on the size of those tusks, which may be an honest signal which, um, which communicates their status as well as their underlying nutritional condition. So that big, large tusk is saying to females, I've got good genes, uh, so you want to recombine your genes with me. So unlike dolphins, which generally have a beak, the three genera and seven species of porpoises in the family Phosoenidae have no distinct beak. Whereas porpoises were traditionally considered a sister group to the dolphin family, molecular analyses has now grouped them closer to the monodontids, the belugas and the narwhals that we just covered. So these phocenids generally are small and stocky, ranging in total length from only about 1.5 meters in the vaquita up to about 2.2 meters in the doll's porpoise, which is shown here. So I wanted to take a moment and point out that there are unique ways that you can contribute to conservation with your new biology or ecology degrees. And one of those ways is by making meaningful media. So this is a trailer for an amazing film called Sea of Shadows, for which an old colleague and a friend from Utah State University, Rue Mahoney, was the field producer. So Rue is just a brilliant human being, and this is a brilliant film that you should see. 
So it was actually paid for by Leonardo DiCaprio, and it's going to talk about the plight of the vaquita, the little sea cow, the most endangered cetacean in the world. It's being driven into extinction by being hung up in gill nets by poachers that are after the high value and endangered totoaba. So they want the swim bladder from this endangered fish, which is a delicacy in China. So it's called the cocaine of the sea. And the swim bladder from this endangered totoaba is worth about $46,000 per kilogram. And the drug cartels know it. So I understand that you don't have time to watch a two-hour film right now. I need you preparing for your upcoming final and uh, really making some beautiful capstone projects. But maybe when the course is over, take a couple hours and check out Sea of Shadows. And for now, check out the trailer. It's quite exciting. The dolphin family is comprised of 17 genera and approximately 38 to 40 species of dolphins. It's the most diverse family of cetaceans and includes about 40% of extant whales. New species will likely be designated in the future. So for example, there are three distinct ecotypes or true races of killer whales that have not interbred for some 10,000 years. They're in the process of speciating. So the ones you probably most familiar with are the resident killer whales here on the top left. They're the ones that are most commonly sighted uh, in the northwestern United States and southeast Alaska. The resident killer whales diets consist primarily of large fish. So these are the salmon hunting specialists. Okay, And then you can see the female resident killer whales have this distinct curved dorsal fin tip. So the morphology of these whales is actually beginning to change as they speciate. So they visit the same areas the residents do consistently. Um, the British Columbia and Washington resident populations are among the most intensively studied marine mammals anywhere in the world. Residents have identified and named over 300 resident killer whales over the past 30 years. The second ecotype, the second race, are the transient whales, which are right here. D is the transient whales. And so these whales prey almost exclusively on marine mammals, on the pinnipeds. They're not hunting salmon. Transient killer whales are traveling in small groups, usually two to six animals, and they're roaming widely up and down the coasts in both northern and southern hemispheres. And they're keenly aware of the timing and the locations of seal and sea lion pupping grounds. So these are the marine mammal, the pinniped hunters. And then the last group, the offshore or the pelagic killer whales. As their name suggests, they're gonna live their entire lives far from shore in the endless blue. Little is known about their habits other than that they are genetically quite distinct from both the residents and the transients. They're gonna congregate in groups of 20 to 75 offshore pelagic whales, occasionally with sightings of very large groups of up to 200 whales. They're thought to primarily be feeding on schooling fish like halibut and then other pelagic species like other dolphins and even sharks. So killer whales, they're truly the ocean's apex predators. This is the last video I am going to ask you to watch for ABS 470. So it's inside the killer whale matriarchy. It shows just how important killer whale grandmothers are for the transmission of pod-specific culture. The family Inidae contains only the South American river dolphin, or the boto, which occurs in both the Orinoco and the Amazon river basins throughout northern South America, an area about 7 million kilometers square, where it inhabits 
only fresh water. It's also called the Pink River Dolphin. The Bolto echolocates in an acoustically difficult environment because of shallow, turbid waters and dense vegetation in the Amazon River that's just not experienced by other toothed whales. What's absolutely crazy, though, is when the Amazon River floods its banks and fills the forest seasonally, the Bolto will swim through the trees hunting. A pink river dolphin swimming through a tropical rainforest. Isn't evolution just wondrous? The Chinese river dolphin, or the Bahi, is or was restricted to the Yangtze River system. From thousands of dolphins in the 1950s to only a few dozen individuals believed to be alive by the late 1990s, the last confirmed sighting of a Bahi was in 2002. The Bahi is most likely extinct, and it was declared as such by the IUCN in 2007. It was doomed by over-harvest, collision with boats, industrial pollution, and then the massive Three Gorges Dam. So conservation is not easy. The Three Gorges Dam generates lots of carbon-free power, but dams also dramatically alter river systems. As noted by Smith, 2014, the Chinese river dolphin is the first cetacean to go extinct because of humans and it represents the loss of 20 million years of evolutionary history. The Bahi has been in the Yangtze River for 20 million years, and we wiped it off the face of the planet in 50 years. The family Pontoporidae includes the La Plata River Dolphin, or the Franciscana. It occurs in coastal marine waters of Argentina, Uruguay, and southern Brazil. It's one of the smallest river dolphins, so mean body length of females is only about 1.6 meters, males is only 1.4 meters. So given this reverse sexual size dimorphism, as well as the low testes weight and the lack of scars from intrasexual fighting, this species is believed to have a monogamous mating system. Kind of cool. Um, this is clearly a calf, uh, but boy, isn't that adorable. And the last family of river dolphins is the Platanistidae. So previously, all of the river dolphins were lumped into the Platanus today, into this family, but molecular studies have found that they're not a monophyletic group. What does that mean? Each one of these river dolphins represents an independent colonization of a freshwater river system and then an evolution into a freshwater species. So we see it in South America, we saw it in Southeast Asia, and now we have this species in South Asia, in India, in the Ganges River. So this is the Ganges River Dolphin, or the Susu. This one is also endangered. Hopefully we don't lose it like the Chinese River Dolphin. Um, it's again negatively affected by dam construction, by gill nets. So the reason why dolphins have such a hard time with gill nets is they get hung up in these big nets. Um, they're not what the fishermen are going after. They're, they're inadvertently caught um, and then they drown because they can't get up to the surface to breathe. As well as declines in water quality in the Ganges. Um, siltation, and then just decreased prey base because of overfishing. The family Ziphidae is a diverse family of six genera and 22 extant species of beaked whales, named for this long rostrum or beak. The Ziphids occur in all oceans, and as I mentioned at the outset, this species, the Cuvier's beaked whale, is holds the record for deepest dive close to 3,000 meters. So the Zephids are diving deep and they're feeding on smaller species of squid and fishes actually capturing them through suction. 
like that of the river dolphins that we just covered, the taxonomy of these zephids remains problematic. So their natural history and conservation status is poorly known because they're uncommon, they're really difficult to identify at sea, and they spend most of their lives in the deep water. So much of what we know about this family comes from stranded individuals. Of the 21 species in this family recognized by the IUCN, 19 are considered data deficient as far as determining their population trends. So much work remains to be done. The dwarf and pygmy sperm whales are distinct enough to be placed in their own family, the Cogidae. Both species, the smaller species of sperm whales, are squid specialists. They're distributed worldwide, and they can actually be fairly common in tropical and temperate waters. The pygmy and the dwarf sperm, sperm whales, however, are rarely seen at sea, and we don't know a lot about their life histories. And finally, Given that you watched a 20 minute video on sperm whale diving physiology and echolocation, I'm just going to remind you here uh, that they're, this is a monotypic family. Um, the other thing too that's super fascinating about sperm whales before I let you go is that they prey on giant squid. So, and we know this because when they beach, they have all this scarring on their rostrum and on their melon. These are tentacle scars. You can actually see the suction cup rings. So these are from those giant squid, which is another really mysterious creature of the deep ocean twilight zone um, that I find absolutely fascinating. So the sperm whale preying on giant squid. And with that, please, please, please reach out to me if you have any questions or concerns about your upcoming comprehensive final assessment or the nuts and bolts of your capstone project. So I'm here for you. In closing, <laughs> I know I threw a lot of content at you in a short amount of time, um, but I sure tried to make it engaging. I have to admit, putting these lectures together was a labor of love. It was incredibly time intensive. So I really hope that you found them engaging, entertaining, informative. So in closing, I want you to know that I write a lot of letters of recommendation for my Estrella Mountain Community College students, many of whom have gone on to do really amazing things. So. If you've done well in this course, please reach out to me and let me know how I can help you achieve your dreams. So if you made it this far, I feel that you are now well equipped with a solid foundational knowledge in mammalogy. I wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors. And as they say, may the wind be at your back. Thank you.